I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about JavaScript tours, pull quotes, and CSS frameworks. Let's check it out. First up, we'll be talking about a project called trip.js. Trip.js is something that'll let you do introductory tours or trips around your web pages. Uh, this is going to be something that you'll see when you want to give somebody a demo tour of your website. What separates trip.js from some other plugins we featured on the show is that the tour can happen automatically. So you'll see I click the start a tour button and it goes through and shows you all of the different things that you need using tooltips on various parts of your page. And it's pretty easy to use. Uh, it has just a few different methods that you can see, um, start, stop, pause, next, and previous. Um, and it, you just give it a selector, some content to display, as well as a delay. So you can check that out in the show notes, which you can find in our iTunes feed or on our YouTube channel. Wow, that's a that's a trip, Jason. You here, you here tripping. Ah, uh, all right, puns. Uh, next up is this really amazing article about pull quotes using HTML HTML five and CSS. Now, of course, pull quotes are those quotes you see in like a magazine article where they pull out a quote and make the text big and put a bunch of spacing around it and make it look like a really important quote. Um, of course, you can do this on a web page. The problem with it is, typically, is that you'll have a bunch of text and then you'll have the pull quote as yet another piece of text, so you'll be duplicating the content. This is bad because it's not really very semantic. Basically, you want to create a situation where you only have that content there once. So what this article suggests is that you actually use CSS to pull out that data and then replicate it and basically set the quote in the proper place and add all the padding and spacing around it so that you only have the content once. Now, this is really good for, say, screen readers or SEO, basically situations where there's going to be an automated software process going through the, the text and not necessarily a person. So it only gets repeated once or doesn't get repeated at all. It, I think this is a pretty ingenious use of uh, a data tag. Yes, know, it is. Just take the data pull quote attribute and format that. Pretty, uh, pretty smart how, how they pulled that out. Over there. Let's see what you did there. Uh, next up, we have a project called jQuery.pin. Uh, this is a jQuery plugin, as you might expect. And what this does, this lets you pin certain content as you're scrolling around your page. Now, it is not limited to any specific thing. Uh, we have a demo right here. You'll see on the right-hand side, they have a, a little, little note right here that says pin it. And as I'm scrolling, this gets pinned to the top of the screen. Whoa. Yeah. That's amazing. I know. Um, now, it's not limited to just the top of the screen. You can pin it within a certain container, and you can also pin it on, you can disable this on small screens, which is, you know, going to be great since we are in the age of responsive web design. Probably going to not want to stick elements to the top of the screen when you don't have a lot of screen real estate to deal with. Anyway, that's uh, jQuery.pin. Very cool stuff. Next up is Yet another amazing article over on CSS Tricks. Friend, friend of Treehouse. Friend of the show. Um, F-O-T-S if you're making acronyms. Chris Goyer has written this article about using SVGs. It's basically just a really great overview of SVGs or scalable vector graphics, what they are, why you should use them, and how you can use them in your web pages. Now, SVGs, of course, use vectors instead of bitmapped graphics. So what that means is that they use a lot of really complicated math to basically create a flat or, you know, similar approximation of an image, right? So this is really good if you have, yeah, flat graphics or, 
you know, maybe some sort of chart that you want to go ahead and display. And you could, of course, also use this for other types of interface elements, such as buttons where you want to have maybe some sort of really crazy shape to them or something like that. that I like might, crazy shape buttons. might be difficult to do in CSS. There's, there's tons of examples you can come up with, but anywhere you can use an image, you can also use an SVG. The huge advantage to this is that a, they're resolution independent, so, you know, in the age of retina displays or high resolution displays, you can go ahead and display SVG graphics without having to have, like, two separate bitmapped images and figure out which one that you should display. And they're also typically, well, in some instances, they have a smaller file size, um, so they can improve your front-end performance. There's tons of other benefits to using SVGs, but they can be a little bit tricky to get started with if you're not familiar with them. And that's what this article is all about. Very nice. Very cool stuff. Uh, next up, we have a blog post about DevTools extensions for web app developers. This is by Adi Osmani, who is just a content machine. So if you're developing web applications, there's a plugin that you can get for the Chrome developer tools for just about any framework that you're using. So he goes through and shows some of what is available. There is the Ember Inspector for Ember.js. This is going to let you look into different models and see their attributes, different layers going on in an application. If you use Backbone.js, there is an extension for that as well, so you can see the different events, um, any different view DOM bindings there are. Uh, there's something for Angular, Thorax, Knockout.js. Most frameworks have a plugin for the Chrome developer tools. Another interesting thing that he goes over is Rails panel, which will show you your Ruby on Rails logs right inside of the Chrome developer tools, which is a really, really useful plugin. Uh, anyway, we'll have this whole link in the show notes if you want to check it out. It's a great article to go and grab some of these plugins. Very cool stuff. <clears throat> so, Jason, I'm going to throw out a vocab word here. Okay. It's called skewmorphism. All right. So, there's this debate raging in the design community. Raging. And a lot of it, of course, is centered around Apple as they are pretty big thought leaders in design. But uh, basically, skewmorphism is when you have a real-world object that you're trying to represent in a digital interface. So iCal in... Um, in the Mac OS X operating system is a great example of that. You have calendars in the real world with, you know, paper and maybe some sort of leather and stitching on it. And they've duplicated that exact graphic inside of their operating system in, in the iCal interface. So this is a little weird, actually, because not everything has a real-world equivalent. For example, there's the Find My Friends app on, on the iPhone where there's not a real world equivalent to, you know, having a GPS and a map where you can find all of your friends. Yeah, it's not a graphic of a car following someone around. Exactly. Something you're very familiar with, Jason. It's not creepy at all. Um, but it's not a real world thing, and yet they treat it like it is. Mm. They have this textured paper, they have, you know, these leather textures, leather stitching, etc. And it looks like it should be some sort of magical address book that you can open up, and yet it doesn't exist. So the backlash to that is... Yeah, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is people using uh, very flat graphics. So this could is... could be like Windows Phone, Windows 8, things like that. Exactly. This is exhibited in uh, Microsoft's Metro design language, which is features, featured in Windows 8 on Xbox, on their uh, Windows mobile operating systems. So it's not really a battle between Microsoft and Apple like you know we understand historically. And this is not unique to Apple and Microsoft. This is seen all over the design community, people using flat design, people using skeuomorphism. But uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting debate because people are trying to figure out, you know, does skeuomorphism really help you say, 
understand how to use an interface more quickly, or is it really holding us back from developing new things that could only exist in a digital environment? But there's sort of the same argument with the whole flat UI paradigm, where people sometimes might not know if something is a button or a link, or if it's clickable, or what it is. They just see a bunch of squares on a page, and, and they freak out. What do I do with this? I don't know. Very true. I'm, I'm going to go play in the real world. There is really no right answer here, at least not just yet. But if, if you're into the flat whole design paradigm, we, that's have a, right. we have a plug in for you. We have a great, great link here for you. This is why this whole, we launched it into this whole diatribe. got out of control quick. Diatribe. Yes, it did. Anyway, Almost Flat UI is based on foundation framework, and it's basically a collection of really flat UI. So this is the opposite of skeuomorphism. You have top bars or breadcrumbs just like this, and they're all really flat. You'll notice that there's no dimensionality or texture being expressed here. Here's a bunch of almost flat buttons, and they do say almost flat because there is a little bit of a slight gradient here to perhaps suggest that this is a clickable button, but it's very minimal. Of course, you can have these buttons in all different sizes and different types, button groups, forms, etc. There's also a set of typography, links, lists, etc., and everything that you would expect from a really good CSS framework. But this is interesting, and if you are into the whole flat UI side of the skeuomorphism versus flat UI debate, then this is for you, and you should definitely check it out. Yeah. I personally don't really have a strong preference one way or the other. I'm just kind of... You're just kind of there? Just kind of a bystander watching this interesting design, bait, uh, design debate rage on. Tweet at Nick RP with your comments. Yes, please do. <laughs> Next up, we have a post entitled Practical Tips from Top WordPress Pros. And I think they, they wrote it like that to make you have a hard time pronouncing it, but I pretty much nailed it. Practical tips from top WordPress pros. There you go. I should say that five times before we start the show. Uh, so anyway, just a, a good collection of tips here using everything WordPress has to offer. There's actually a lot of stuff built into WordPress that you might not know about. They have a, a huge API, and there's even a lot to offer at the help screen. So if you're developing a plugin or something like that, you can actually leverage the built-in help screens in WordPress and you know write stuff to display in there with uh, the different settings for your plugin. Uh, you can use hooks. I would say use hooks pretty liberally. WordPress lets you hook into a lot of the different behavior uh, when displaying an app. You know, there's everything from displaying the header, title, all sorts of different sidebars. So you can use that to your advantage when you're developing themes or plugins. Um, they're talking about following best practices, embracing the code base. Just a ton of different tips, and actually probably a lot too much to explain here, which is going to give you even more motivation to check out our show notes in iTunes, search The Treehouse Show, or on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse. All right. Word. <laughs> Very impressed. All nice. Right. I'll, I'll end it that there. Was, that was a... No, that was, that was awful. That was a pun. Next up is Foundation, and they've just released their fourth version of the Foundation framework. This is what the almost flat UI was <clears throat> based on. That's right. So this is Zurb Foundation 4. We have covered Foundation in the past on the show. I think I think we yes, talked we about have. I think we talked about Foundation 3. Well, this is Foundation 4. That's one better. Yes, it is. What's new in Foundation 4? Well, First of all, it's mobile first. So if you're designing a responsive design, you can go ahead and design the mobile version first and then work your way up to larger and larger screens with more complexity. It is semantic. Of course, it was probably semantic before, but now I guess it's more semantic. And it has awesome JavaScript. So pretty cool stuff. I mean, Zurb Foundation is a really amazing well thought of CSS framework. There are, of course, many others, um, Bootstrap being one of the more notable ones, but um, pretty amazing stuff here. One thing that's interesting in the Foundation 4 grid is that they actually took into account a grid for different size screens. Yes. So you can create a grid that will only display on mobile. I think you use the uh, small attribute, like small two columns, and then same thing with large column grid. So. 
But pretty, pretty interesting. If you're starting a new project and whether you're a seasoned veteran of the web or if you're just brand new to all this stuff, you definitely should go ahead and use a CSS framework like Zurb or yeah. Bootstrap or you know whatever fits the needs of your project or your personal preferences. Yeah, we've reviewed literally hundreds on this show, so just go back into the archive, maybe in the iTunes feed. Yeah, maybe in, in iTunes, <laughs> which we're on now, yeah. by the way. <laughs> Weird how that keeps coming up. Yeah. Strange. Huh. Uh, anyway, who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. Uh, if you like this podcast, check us out on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash go treehouse or in iTunes. Just search for the Treehouse Show. There it is again. Strange. Yeah. If you'd like to see more videos like this one about business, web design, web development, iOS, Android, and more, be sure to check us out at teamtreehouse.com. I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Cipher. We said our names again. Thanks yeah. so much for watching. We're we'll the hosts. We'll see you next week. If you'd like to see more advanced videos and tutorials like this one, go to teamtreehouse.com and start learning for free.